it's our, our time to turn uh, to the written word of God. Uh, if you would stand with us for the reading of God's word. Uh, we have, we've been working uh, through this series slowly but surely through uh, the gospel of Mark. And in the gospel of Mark, uh, we've been talking about the mind of Christ. Our theme in, in uh, 2015 is, but we have the mind of Christ. That means that no matter what we face, no matter what situation we go through, we will respond to it by saying, I've got the mind of Christ. That means somebody else might lose their mind. Somebody else might curse somebody out. Somebody else might give up hope. But we have the mind of Christ. We've been studying this here in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, here we are today in chapter 3. And I'm going to read verses 13 through 19 uh, in your hearing. Mark chapter 3 verses 13 through 19. When last week we, we were in chapter 3 as well, we talked about don't box me in. The prior week we talked about are you ready for new wine? This week here we are in chapter 13 and we, we get to see a list of who Jesus calls to be his disciples. It reads, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, which means sent ones, that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be unto God. You may be seated. As you take your seats, help me title this sermon. Look at your neighbor and say, who's with me? Find somebody else, look at them and say, who's with me? Let's look to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we come today saying thank you, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, Lord God, that you have brought us to this place to hear your word. Father, we declare this morning that we have not come here for form or fashion. We have not come here just to see who else was going to be here. We have come to meet with you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so, Father, we pray now that you would speak to us, for we're listening. We need a word. We can't make it through this week without a word from you. So have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who's with me? In the year 1996, a movie was released starring Tom Cruise and Cuba Gooding Jr. The movie was entitled Jerry Maguire, and it told the story of a sports agent who had an epiphany about the industry he was working in. He was an agent in a large company and the company was all about the dollars, all about the bottom line and he wanted to be more focused on people. He had this moral epiphany. He came in and he expressed it and guess what? He lost his job. When he came in and, and he told people that he wanted to do something in a different way, he was fired for expressing it. In a memorable scene in the movie, church, after Jerry Maguire is fired, he stands up and he addresses the office of about a hundred folks. He is emotional. He's embarrassed because he just got fired. He's not completely coherent, but his desire is to get some people to join him in starting a new business. So he passionately speaks about his dream, his vision. At the end of his speech, after he believes he has stated his case well, he utters those words that he hopes will incite a resounding response. He utters those words that he hopes will validate all of his emotion and all of his passion that he's just poured in. He believes he has just rallied the troops. He thinks everybody's going to come with him. And he stands up and he screams out to the whole office, who's coming with me? The passion that he has is clear, but unfortunately, the response is dead silence. People are looking at him like he's crazy. Nobody even moves. Even his own assistant won't go with him. 
He tries to call her name, and she says, no, I got a few months before I get my retirement. I can't go with you. This could mean two things, church, that either his vision was bad, his idea was horrible, or it could mean that everyone was so entrenched in the old system that they are not even open to the new idea that he's presenting. It could mean that everybody was so caught up in the old way that things were done that they can't even see what he believes is possible. But even in that, he still cries out, who's with me? In the end of the scene, the only supporters who go with him are the woman who likes him and the one goldfish he has taken from the office aquarium. If you've seen the movie, you remember the iconic moment where he's holding up a goldfish in his hand and he says, who else is coming with me? And only the woman who is romantically interested in him stands up and says she'll go. He said that's all the support he could get. The question that he asks, though, is a powerful question. It's a question that draws a line in the sand because it really allows you to know who's really got your back. This is the question you ask when, when you're making a decision that could alter the course of your life. This is the question that separates the men from the boys, the, the women from the girls. It separates those who talk about it from those who really are about it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There, there are a lot of folks who know how to, how to talk a good game. There, there are a lot of folks who, who can tell a good story, but not everybody is really about it. Th this is the question that leaders have to ask when they receive a vision. They got to ask, who is with me? Has anybody ever come upon a situation where you had to ask that question, who's with me? Come on, I need, I need some honest folks who, who have been in some scenarios where you had to make a decision where you knew everybody wasn't going to be on your side. You had to make a decision where you knew everybody might not go with you. You had to make a choice and draw a line in the sand, and you had to step out on faith and say, who's coming with me? When your back is against the wall, especially when, when the powers that be are on the other side of the equation, this is not an easy question to ask. Sometimes, though, you don't even have to ask this question because when things get tight in your life, it's real easy to find out who's with you because the folk you thought had your back ain't nowhere near you. Come on, somebody. There have been some situations in your life. Maybe I'm the only one. There's been some situations in my life where I thought some people were on my team. I, I thought they had my back. But, but when the situation really got tight and I turned around, I saw they was way back. They were so far back, I couldn't even call them. There, there's some folk that, that you have tried to pick up the phone and, and they didn't answer. And that's when you realize not everybody is on my team. Not everybody wants to see me succeed. And so sometimes you got to ask the question, who's with me this phrase it, it resonates with our text today because we see Jesus appointing 12 disciples we get a chance to see who was with him this is relevant for us because we get to understand the mind of Christ as he is appointing these disciples we also get to understand some of their characteristics that are similar to you and I that, that's really what's going to be powerful today. We're going to get a chance to see how these 12 men who changed the world from the power of Christ, how they are similar to you and I sitting in this church today. One of the first things that I noticed in this text, though, is that Jesus did not even have to ask the question, who's with me? All of the gospel writers, they simply record that Jesus was walking by and he would oftentimes just say, follow me. He keep walking. Follow me. And now you wonder, why could he do that? The reason was because his witness was so powerful, his lifestyle was so impactful that he didn't even have to ask a question of allegiance. All he had to do was give a command and people got up and walked with him. That, that meant his, his power was so evident that people will follow him without him even asking a question. Watch this, church. God is calling us to live the kind of lives that make people want to be around us because it's evident that we're following God. You see, we got to start living the kind of lives that make people want to be with us because it's so clear that God is doing something in us. It was so clear that God was moving in Jesus' life because he was healing the sick. He was casting out demons. He was teaching with authority. It was so clear that God was in him, that God was with him, that as soon as he said, follow me, he and he had to turn around. People just started following behind him. 
verse 13 of chapter 3, it says, He went up on a mountainside and he called those he wanted, and they came to him. They did not apply. They did not submit a resume. They did not submit a, a curriculum vita of all their, all their accolades. They did not submit all of their support. They didn't have to submit no references. He said, y'all the ones I want, and they follow. As we study this text today, I want to point out three things that we can learn from these disciples who Jesus calls. The first thing that we learn today is that Jesus calls, number one, those who are willing to lose their identity. Turn to your neighbor and say, let me see your ID. <laughs> Jesus calls, he calls those who are willing to lose their identity. In the year 1992, the Summer Olympics were held in Barcelona, Spain. This was the first year that countries could use professional basketball players on their Olympic teams. That means prior to this point, every time there was Olympic basketball games, there were only amateur athletes or college players who played. But in 1992, it was the first year that professionals could join the Olympic team. And some of you may remember that the United States had a basketball team called the Dream Team. Anybody remember the Dream Team? This team, it incorporated some of the greatest basketball players of all time. I'm, I'm talking about Michael Jordan and, and Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, Patrick and the list goes on and on. It was a who's who of the NBA. Now, all of these players were stars on their individual teams. They were the center of attention, but in order for this new team to be successful, everybody could not be the center of attention. In order for them to win the gold medal, they were going to have to sacrifice a part of who they were on their old team so that they could have success on this new team. I need y'all to hear what I'm saying. The, the sacrifice of their identity was not easy because they were the ones on their team who always got the ball. They were the ones on their team who always took the shot. And so now the coach is saying, I need you to be on this new team, and if we're going to have success, every Everybody can't be who they used to be on their old team. I, I, I need somebody to hear what I'm saying. Now, he, the coach had to say to them, you've got to function differently than you did on your old squad. The, the parallel to this text and to our lives is that Jesus is showing us that he calls those who are willing to shed their old identity and say, I'm willing to do some things differently now because I'm on a new team. Jesus says, I'm looking for some folks who are willing to say, I don't walk the way I used to walk because I'm on a new team. I can't talk the way I used to talk because I'm on a new team. And I don't do some things I used to do anymore because Jesus Christ has changed my identity. I wonder if there's some folk in here who if people came to you and they knew you 20 years ago, they might not recognize you. And if they ask you a question, you could say, I know I don't act the same, but I made a trade. I'm on a new team. I'm playing for a new coach. I've got a new master and his name is Jesus. Paul says it like this, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new, a new creature. The old has gone and the new has come. Paul is saying, once I get on Jesus' team, some things about my life change, some things about my attitude change, and I can't operate in my old identity. You see, church, the problem with, with Superman is that he always has to go back to being Clark Kent. I need y'all to catch that. I need y'all to stay with me. The problem with Superman is that he always has to go back to being Clark Kent. Even though he knows the power that he has on the inside, he has to hide it in a suit and tie so that he can fit in with the culture. Y'all, some of y'all are missing this. He, 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 has, he has power on the inside, but because of the world around him that he
he wants to fit in, he has to try to uh, uh, blend into the culture. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, I'm looking for some folk who are willing to kick Clark Kent to the curb. I'm looking for some folk who are willing to say, I want the supernatural me every day. I don't want to have to hide what God has put on the inside. I don't want to have to put on uh, another outfit so that folks can be comfortable with me. I don't want to have to act a certain way when I get in certain settings, but I want to kick Clark Kent to the curb. I don't want to be Bruce Wayne anymore. I, I, I want to be who I am so that the power can shine through me. What does that mean for the believer? That means I want to be in prayer every day. I want to be able to read my word every day. I want to be able to walk by faith and not by sight every day. I want to be the head and not the tail every day. I want to be more than a conqueror every day. I want no weapon to form against me and prosper every day. Some of y'all may just want that once a month. Some of y'all may just want that once a week. But I want the supernatural power of God in my life every day. Mm. I, 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 don't want, I don't want the Superman faith that only comes out every once in a while. But I, I want what God has for me every day. And so this is how, this is how we see this in the text. Mark is so clever in how he, he breaks this down for us because he says Jesus appointed 12 disciples and he begins to name them. And you think, oh, this is just a list of names. It's not that important. But he says, look, look at what he did. He says, he calls Simon and says, I'm going to give you the name Peter. Then he says, he appointed James and John and he says, I'm going to give you all the nickname Sons of Thunder. In both of these cases, church, Jesus is calling these men to release their old identity. You see, there's a, there's a point where, where Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, who do people say I am? And, and they say, some people say you John the Baptist, some say you Elijah. And then Peter steps up, and it, or his name is Simon at that point. He steps up and says, he says, I say you're the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And he says, oh, I'm going to call you Peter, which, which in the Greek is Petros, which means rock. And he's saying, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. What he's saying is, he's saying, he's saying, Simon, I know how you used to operate. I know how people used to know you and understand you, but I'm going to change your name so that every time I call you, you will be reminded of the kind of faith you have. That every time I call your name, you will be reminded of what I've called you out of and what I'm calling you into. Every time I speak your name, you will shed some of your old identity and begin to walk in your new identity. And so when somebody comes up to you and says, Simon, you can say, no, nah, my name is Peter uh, because I'm the rock uh, that Christ is going to build his church upon. God says to somebody in the house uh, that he's been changing your name. He's been changing your identity. Uh, that's why people don't recognize you like they used to. Uh, that's why some of the folk don't call you up anymore uh, because you're different now. Uh, I used to get mad when people didn't call me uh, who used to be my friends, but I realized uh, that I'm not the same person person I used to be so they ain't got nothing to talk to me about Lord have mercy I wish somebody would hear what I'm saying in here see they they used to be able to talk to me about dumb stuff they used to be able to talk to me about stupid stuff they used to be able to talk to me about other women they used to be able to talk to me about stuff that did not glorify God but now that they don't call me I'm not mad because that's not who I am anymore Ah, uh, Jesus, Jesus says, he says, Simon, I'm going to call you Peter so you can walk into your new identity. Not only that, then he goes on and he says, he says, James and John, I'm going to call y'all the sons of thunder. Now watch this. James and John were known when you read the scriptures to have hot tempers. The Bible says one time in Luke chapter 9 that Jesus, James, and John were getting ready to go into a village. And when they got there, the village did not accept them. And James and John said, Jesus, we should burn this place down. <laughs> Y'all think I'm joking. Read your Bible. That's what it says. It literally says, James and John say, they say, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven on these folk? How they not going to let us in? We want to burn this place up. And Jesus says, I rebuke that. <laughs> he, says, he says, that's not how we're going to roll. We're not just going to go and burn places down. If they don't want
want you, shake the dust off your feet and keep it moving. Right? <laughs> but James and John, they like, they like, burn it down. Who got the matches? Right? But watch this. Jesus says, I, I see your passion. I see your emotion. But I'm going to call you the sons of thunder because I'm going to take aspects of your personality and I'm going to use them for the kingdom of God. What used to be used for the enemy is now going to be used for God's glory because I'm going to shed your old identity and call you into your new identity. God says to somebody in this place that he's going to use some things that were part of your old personality. He's going to shape them and mold them, and then he's going to bless the kingdom of God through them. He says, I know somebody in here used to have passion in their old life, but now I'm going to take that passion, and it's going to help get people saved. I know somebody in here used to dance, but now you can dance for Jesus. I know somebody in here used to operate in a certain way, but once I get my hands on that old identity, I I can change it. I can shape it so that God can get the glory. Yeah. See, God's saying, I, I'm not going to throw out every part of who you are, but I'm going to take who you are and I'm going to mold it. I'm going to shape it for my kingdom. You see, Jesus wants us to understand that he needs people who are willing to lose their old identity. That's why Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he would say these words, but what things were gained to me, I count loss for the sake of Christ. He's saying, I used to put so much stock in all these things, where, where I was from and, and what tribe I was born in and the fact that I was a Pharisee, all these things. But he says, now you know what? I got to shed my old identity so that God can get the glory in my life. The question for us today, church, is, have we left some old things behind? And what are we still needing to shed? Lord, have mercy. You see, there's still some things that we need to shed because they can get us caught up. You see, there are, there are some, some, some animals in, in uh, the reptile kingdom uh, that, that when they get attacked, they have the ability to lose their tail. They have the ability to shed some of their skin because they recognize even if the enemy gets a hold of that, I can still keep moving forward. And there are some things in our lives that the enemy is trying to grab onto, but if we would just shed that part of our old identity, we could be who God is calling us to be. So... Who, who does Jesus call? He calls those who are willing to lose their identity. But secondly, watch this, watch this now. He also calls those who are from very different backgrounds. This, this, is, this is good right here. He calls folks from very different backgrounds. From, from this list, this list of scripture that sometimes we skip over, we see the diversity among the apostles. From our studies, we know that, that at least four of them were fishermen. That we can estimate that some of them were, were farmers. We know that one of them was a tax collector and one of them was a political radical. And this really just scratches the surface of their diversity. Part of what the Lord wants to teach us today is that it does not matter what your background is, but he can use you for his glory. Somebody ought to say amen. Amen. It does not matter what your race is. It does not matter where you grew up. It does not matter what your social status is. Jesus says, I can use you. And I'm picking these 12 disciples as an example that I can use anybody and I can call them to a place of greater productivity. He's saying, I can pick anybody and I can use them in my kingdom. What God wants us to grab a hold of today, that no matter where you come from, no matter what your background is, no matter how difficult it's been in your life, God is saying, I can still use you. Sometimes we, we count ourselves out. We cross ourselves off the list. But God is saying, through the selection of these disciples, I want you to. Ah, you see, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were wondering, who is this man going to pick as his disciples, as his closest followers? They were thinking, it's going to be us. It's going to be us because we're the most educated. We know the most. We've been in this the longest. But Jesus said, I'm going to pick some folk you never would have expected because then when I pour into them, it will be clear that the power is not from them, but the power is flowing.
flowing through them. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Jesus wants to show us diversity. He also wants to show this diversity because he wants the world to know that only the power of God can cause some of these folk to get along. Uh, I need, I need y'all to see this. <laughs> he's, saying, he's saying that it is the power of God that can draw these folk from different backgrounds together for his glory. Can I keep it real up in here? That, there are some folks up in Macedonia right now who don't even like each other. You, you saw somebody, you was mad. You're like, why you come to the 10 o'clock? <laughs> so why you come to the 10 o'clock? That's, that's my service, right? You, you, came, you came and you're wondering, right, if you're going to see them because you don't really have the best relationship with them. But Jesus wants us to understand that part of what he's doing in calling together this diverse group of folks is that the glory of God can bring together people who would normally not be connected and they can help change the world. God says, I, I'm able, I'm able to bring folk from different racial backgrounds, from different economic backgrounds, from different social backgrounds, and the power is going to be when I bring them together, that's when the world is going to know who I am. You see, part of the reason the world is so confused about Jesus is because we so divided. But if we could get united, that's when the world will say, ah, oh, there, there really must be a God. There, there must be a Savior, and he must love us more than we can imagine. Let, let, me, let me show this to you in the text real clearly. The Bible says in verse 18 that Simon is a zealot. The zealots were a radical political group in this time. I'm going to walk you through some history. They hated the Roman government because the Roman government had rule over the Jewish people. And so these zealots were a, a radical political group that hated the Roman government because they were occupying the Jewish land. They hated Roman soldiers, and they were so radical that they actually, some of them, would carry daggers in their waistbands, and if they caught a Roman soldier by himself, they might take him out. That, that's how radical they were. They were gangster, right? They had, had the knife in the waist, right? Now, now. Let me help you with this. On the other hand, Matthew is a, is a Jew, but he's a tax collector. Now, the tax collectors, the problem was the tax collectors were seen as pawns of the Roman government. Why is that? Because the Romans told them, collect the taxes for us, and then they would go extort the people, get more money, and then they would give some of that money back to the Romans. And so here you have a brother named Simon the Zealot who hates the Roman Empire and is willing to kill somebody. And then over here you got Matthew who is working for the Romans to oppress the Jewish people. If they saw each other on the street any other day of the week, it was going to be a problem. Y'all hear what I'm saying? If they, if they ran into each other, it was going to be a problem. Right? But, but what happens is Jesus says, I want to show the world what my power can do. And so I'm going to choose somebody who I know hates somebody else on my team. And what I'm going to do through the power of my spirit is I'm going to bind them together so that when the world sees them working together, they're going to say, this Jesus brother must be real. This Jesus brother must be doing something powerful if he can get a zealot to work with a tax collector. If he can get folks from complete opposite sides of the spectrum to work together in the kingdom of God, then they'll begin to understand who Jesus is. That's why I believe and I hear the Lord saying that he's going to continue to diversify our congregation here at Macedonia Church because he desires for us to be a place of worship that incorporates all different races, all different economic backgrounds, all different geographic boundaries because God says this is to my glory and when the world sees that they're going to say there must be something serious happening on Bedford Avenue. There must be something serious happening in the Hill District because God is bringing together folk who wouldn't normally even like each other. I need y'all to hear what I'm saying. That, that's why, that's why in, in, in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying before he goes to the cross. He says to, to God, he says, I pray that my disciples might be one. Then he says something powerful. He says, because when they are one, 
they'll know that you and I are one. Lord have mercy. He says, as soon as they start operating in unity, that's when people will begin to understand that you and I are one as well. As soon as Christians start to live the glory of God together, that's when folk will begin to understand that God is who he says he is. Jesus said, I'm going to pick Simon the Zealot and I'm going to pick Matthew the tax collector and we're going to change the world together. We're going to flip this thing upside down and Nobody's going to be able to stop us because of the power of God. This is so interesting, church, who Jesus picks to follow him. He says, I'm going to pick those who are willing to lose their identity. I'm going to pick those who come from very different backgrounds. But thirdly and finally, watch this. Jesus says, I'm going to pick those who will deny me, who will doubt me, and who will betray me. Don't, don't miss this, y'all, in the text. This, this, is where, this is where it gets real heavy. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's just tight. It's tight right here. It's tight. <laughs> he, says, he says, I'm going to pick those who will deny me, who will doubt me, and who will betray me. In John chapter 20, when we read throughout the scriptures, we find that, that the disciple named Thomas was not with the rest of the disciples when Jesus uh, came back and appeared to them. And he told them, he said, unless I put my finger in the nail marks, I won't believe. This is how he gets the name Doubting Thomas because he was doubting Jesus. And you and I can relate because oftentimes we too have doubted the Lord. Then when we go over to Mark chapter 14, we find that Jesus is saying, I'm getting ready to go to the cross and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die for your sins and for the sins of the world. And Peter says, I'm not going to let you do it. And then Jesus says, sit down, Peter, stop talking crazy. That's basically what he says. He says, sit down, sit down, Peter. And then, and then Jesus says, you know what, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And, and Peter said, I'll never deny you, Lord. Not me. I said, I'm right or die. I'm here to the end. Jesus said, Peter. <laughs> You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And the Bible says that in the next chapter, Peter denies the Lord three times. Then in Mark chapter 14 as well, we find there's a man named Judas. And, and Judas gets a bag of silver. He gets some money to betray Jesus. And when, when the Roman soldiers come looking for Jesus, Judas comes and he kisses him on the cheek to identify him as the Savior of the world. He betrays Jesus. Church, it's understandable that the followers of Christ will not always do what he wants. But it's hard for me to grasp why he would call apostles who he knows are going to deny him, doubt him, and betray him. It, it makes sense a little bit that, that he, he's going to call those who are willing to lose their identity. It makes sense that he will call those from different backgrounds, but it don't make no sense that he would call those, he would appoint those to be apostles who are going to deny him, doubt him, and even betray him. Are y'all with me? It, it, might, it might make sense that he would let them just follow him. Like he could say, y'all can be in the background because I know y'all going to mess up. But the ones I'm going to call to really be with me in this thing, I can't have folk who are going to deny me, doubt me, and betray me who are going to be with me real close. Right? That just doesn't make any sense. Jesus is omniscient, meaning he knows everything. And that means it was not the case that he didn't know these folk was going to mess him over. <laughs> it was not the case that he didn't know these folk were going to deny him, doubt him, and betray him. Even as early as John chapter 6, the Bible tells a story where all the disciples are eating together and Jesus says, one of y'all are going to betray me. Right? He says, one of y'all going to betray me. And then he takes some bread, he dips it in, and he says, you know what? It's the one who I'm going to get his bread to. <laughs> then, <laughs> then, watch this, watch this. This is crazy. He, he gives the bread to Judas. <laughs> he gives the bread to Judas, and he says, it's you. <laughs> right? But then, Judas stays on the team. <laughs> y'all ain't feeling me. I don't know about y'all, but if I was at the table, I'd have been like, um, can we kick him out then? If, if, if he's the one that's going to set us up, if he's the one that's going to sell us up the river, if he's the one that's going to tell on us, if he's going to snitch, can we get him off the team like right now? 
I don't, I don't understand why we're keeping him around, Jesus. What, what's he going to bring to the table? And Jesus says, no, nah, it's all good. We're going to keep it all together. Because he's calling those who are going to deny him, doubt him, and even betray him. And so I had, to, I had to scratch my head. I had to pray hard. I said, God, I said, God, why, why would you call those who would follow you to be people who might deny you, who might betray you, who might, who might doubt you? This is what he said. Don't miss this. If you don't get anything else, if you don't get anything else today, get this right here. This is what he says. He says, I'm willing to bet that my forgiveness is stronger than their denials. Uh, I need, I need y'all to think on that thing. He said, he says, I, I'm, willing, I'm willing to place this bet that, that my forgiveness is stronger than their denials. So I'm going to still call them to be on my team because I know what they're going to do. I'm already omniscient, but I'm going to place my money on myself that my forgiveness is stronger than their denials. Watch this, that my faithfulness is going to be stronger than their doubt so that even when they get into situations where they doubt me, where they kick me to the curb, just like Thomas... I'm going to come in the room and say, put your finger where the nails were, and I'm going to help them to understand that my faithfulness will last longer than their doubt. And he says, I'm also willing to bet that my love is stronger than their betrayal. Mm. My love is stronger than their betrayal. That means that even when they deny me, I'll forgive them. Even when they doubt me, I'll still be faithful. Even when they betray me, my love will still endure. That's why I'll be hanging on the cross and I'll still be saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do because my forgiveness is stronger than their denial. My faithfulness is stronger than their doubts and my love will endure longer than their betrayals so no matter where they find themselves I'm gonna still be on their side oh I don't know about you but that's good news right now because there might be somebody in here who can say pastor I haven't always been perfect I haven't always done the right thing I have denied the Lord I have doubted the Lord and sometimes if I'm real honest I've even betrayed the Lord but it's good news today to find out that his forgiveness is stronger is stronger than my denial that his faithfulness is stronger than my doubts and his love will last longer than my betrayals. Jesus says the whole reason why I called them to be on my team is because I knew that my love was better than theirs. That's good news. That's good news. He knows, he watches, he knows, he knows that once he forgives our sins, once he forgives our denials, once he dismantles our doubts, and once he overcomes our betrayals, watch this, then our loyalty to him will be unparalleled. See, I, I need y'all to keep thinking with me. I said, I said once, once he forgives our denials, once he dismantles our doubts, and he overcomes our betrayals, then our loyalty to him becomes even stronger. Think, think about this with me. Think about this with me. See, see Jesus understands that, that if, if these disciples have never had to go through anything where they've turned their backs on the Lord and still seen the Lord trusting in them and using them and still loving them, then they might wonder if the Lord is a fair weather friend. And so Jesus says, even though I know you're going to doubt me, even though I know you're going to deny me, I'm actually still going to pick you because I need some folk on my team who have denied me and see that I still love them. I need some folk on my team who have doubted me and see that I'm still faithful because once they see that, it's going to strengthen them even more and they going to say if God will love me even when I deny him if God will love me even when I doubt him how much more if I walk according to his word 
I wish somebody was, was grabbing a hold of this. You see, you see, then they can understand. You see, once you've seen somebody lay it all down for you, that's when you really become ride or die, right? Right? When you see somebody put everything on the line for you, you, you say, you know what? I'm a ride for you. I, I'm a ride for you because I know, I know just what you're willing to do. You see, that, that's, that's what we see happening in the streets is that sometimes somebody will go all out for somebody else and they say, once I seen you do that, that was it. I was sold. And so we as believers who have seen Jesus Christ go to the cross for us, who have seen Jesus Christ love us even in the middle of our mess, who have seen Jesus Christ carry us through some of the greatest trials, we ought to be the strongest ones who are willing to stand up and say, because you took it all for me, because you went to the cross for me, I'm going to be ride or die. I'm going to be sold out. I'm going to be with you till the very end because your love never fails. Now, watch this. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. But watch this. That's why the 12 disciples or the 11 minus Judas were all willing to lose their lives for Jesus. They were hiding in the room and Jesus came and he appeared to them and they got strengthened because they said, you love us even when we doubt you. Whoa! Even when we doubt you, you come and get us. And so they say, because you love us like that, we're going to go all out. And the history books show that all 11 of these men, they lost their lives for the gospel because they were just so about it. They had been so impacted by the love of Jesus Christ that everywhere they went, they proclaimed his name. Everywhere they went, they did signs and miracles. Everywhere they went, they walked by the power of the Spirit because they understood Jesus loved us through our doubts. He loved us through our denials. He loved us through our betrayals. And so because of that, we're not going to turn around. I wonder if there's anybody in here who can say that Jesus loved me through my doubts. I might even be in a place right now where I'm doubting him, where I don't feel his power, but I came to tell somebody that he's loving you now, even through your doubts. He's loving you through your denials. He's loving you through your betrayals. And he's saying to somebody here that you can make it, that the battle is not over as long as he's with you and he wants you to know today that the reason that he stood by you is so that in the middle of the fight in the middle of the battle you can say no matter what comes I'm still going to trust in Jesus because he's the one he's the one who forgives my denials He's the one who overcomes my betrayals. He's the one who dismantles my doubts. Somebody here today who's been doubting what God could do. You've been doubting if he was going to make this change in your life. If he was going to come through in the way you needed him to. And he sent me here to tell you that he's a faithful God. That he's faithful enough, my brother. He's faithful enough, my sister, to overcome even your largest doubts. And when he does, it's going to inspire us to live the kind of lives that honor him. Because of that, we sing to the Lord that great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, God. Your love endures forever. And you never fail. Even when we fail, even when we fall short, His love endures. We're going to sing this together as we allow this word to marinate in our hearts. To realize his love endures and he never fails. Anybody believe we serve a faithful God? Come on, great is. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Your love endures. 